Well, thank you for that great introduction, Steve. Um, luckily, I've known Steve and multiple he people here tonight for many years, so I'm very thankful to be here tonight. Hello, my name is Colin Dobson, and tonight I'll be talking about the best birding hotspots and birds themselves along the Lower Illinois River, and then also incorporating some stories from my past and uh, bird pictures and bird habitats and all these different ecosystems that are south of here on the Illinois River today. I'm just a little different aspect for tonight. I'm originally from Jacksonville, Illinois, which is about two hours south of here. So basically about 15 minutes from the Illinois River. So I, was, I grew up birding basically every day on the Illinois River when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, and even older. So I have very fond memories of all these areas that I've birded for about 10 years of my life. I am a senior graduating from University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign on this coming weekend. So, and I major in natural resource and environment science with a concentration in wildlife biology. And that's off to grad school. I'm actually going to Arkansas State working with um, wetland reserve ecosystems and looking how effective they are for birds. So that's my future goal starting in August. Actually starting in June, but actually moving in August. So I'm an avid bird watcher. I lead two research projects. Steve mentioned the window collision project that I survey twice a day for on our campus for the last two plus years. And I also look into migratory birds on organic farming practices or areas of organic farming practices. You already mentioned me authoring two books I did when I was in high school, talking about all the birds along the Illinois River Flyway. And I have some copies of my book back here tonight that'll, that'll be available at the end. And then I have another one coming up here later this summer that I'll get all the copies for in June and then have a few events and stuff. So stuff to come with that as well. I have other hobbies. It wasn't birding first. It was actually trains when I was really little. And then it was storms and weather. Then it was birds. So trains have completely wiped, been wiped out. But I do storm chase still to, the day, uh, to this day. And I was planning on double majoring in atmospheric science, but I decided just to keep it as a hobby. I also golf. I used to golf all the time when I was in high school. I love hiking, exploring new areas, like herping, although I don't like to hold snakes. I will hold salamanders, but I will not hold snakes. And I just put my contact information there and in my website there. Anyways, and I just, since I was a lot of wording there, but Steve already gave a beautiful introduction, I just put two pictures of aspects of what I do. That was for my recent trip to Ecuador, which actually Steve will be there in August, that same, probably that same spot in the Mindo area. That's a white booted bracket tail that I took a little selfie with there in the bottom of the picture. And this was from Papa, Illinois from two years ago. You can kind of see the tornado back there in the background up there on top. So just defining my two major aspects of, of my life then. So today I'm actually going to be talking about a different subject that I've really never talked about before. I usually talk about my research projects or I've taught a couple of classes with related to birds or my travels. Well, today I'm going to be actually talking about where to bird in areas. I mean, I've written about it, but I've never talked about it. So today I'll be talking about everywhere between here and the confluence of the Illinois Mississippi River because that's a really underbirded area. I actually was originally going to go all the way up to Peoria, but I was like, well, a lot of, a lot of you guys are from Peoria. You guys bird a lot of the Peoria areas. And I realized when I started to make the presentation, I'm like, there's going to be a lot of more to talk about. So basically all this is tonight is basically everywhere from St. Louis all the way up to Havana. Because there are areas that I used to bird all the time, but no one covers anymore. So maybe shred some light on some areas and some great areas that no one covers anymore and to show the natural beauty of some areas but also talk about the birds within them. So, so anyways, I will talk about um, each spot. Um, I made little G GIS maps from ArcGIS Pro. I just screenshotted what I, there's point, pinpoints I put on maps. So I'll have three regions that I'll talk about. So this is my first region. But basically, each region, so this is the region of the confluence of the Illinois Mississippi Rivers. I have this one, the Meridosha area and the Havana area. And all these areas you can cover in a half a day or cover in a day. They're all amazing birding areas, but each region is kind of divided into like how you would maybe cover in a day. So this is about, I don't know, this might be about two and a half hours from here. So this is the farthest. I would say in, the, in terms of all the areas I'll be talking about tonight, it's the most underbirded area out of all of them. So it's close enough to St. Louis where a few St. Louis people come and bird it once in a while, but most people don't go birding in these areas. I like coming down here in like March and April, um, whenever the birds are first arriving, because even from where I'm from in Jacksonville, birds are still a little ahead down here since this is a lot further south. But uh, anyways, so basically, I'll try the laser here. So... These are four areas down in this area. This is Calhoun County here and Jersey County here. And this is Pure Marquette State Park and Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge. Has anyone ever heard of these places or been to them? 
like one. <laughs> so um, I'm going to shed some light on these areas for sure. So, and all these maps I have are just pretty much labeled spots from like north to south. But if I ever birded this area, or ever, I mean, I did it all the time, but I would actually start up here at this place called Copperhead Hollow, which almost no one birds, but that's a very unique site, which I'll explain in a little bit. But in my daily route, if I were to bird here, I would start up Copperhead Hollow, then I would go down Stump Lake, bird Pure Marquette, then cross the Brussels Ferry here, which is free, over to Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge. So that's kind of going to be this section that I'll be talking about here. Basically, for each hot, basically each hot spot that I have, I will talk about each point. I didn't realize whenever I started making this earlier this week, I thought I had basically pictures of all the spots I would talk about. And then I realized I birded all these when I was like 12 and 15, and I didn't have all those pictures on my phone. So um, I figured the best way would just, be, would just be just to have this map of any spots within the site that I thought were useful. I'll just kind of leave this up here, and I'll talk about each spot, and then I'll have some pictures of the habitats within the hot spot, pictures of birds I've seen there, and even just some random pictures I've taken from these places in the past. So just for a reference, so this is in eastern Calhoun County. Uh, basically, Grafton is right, basically right up here. If you know where Grafton is, it's a pretty renowned uh, small town for bald eagles, but also other things. And Pure Marquette's just right across the river. So this is a large natural wildlife refuge. And basically, you have two main, uh, three main aspects. You have the east side, you have the central side, and you have the Basically, I guess it's all metal. But the three main access areas that I go to, a lot of people go to. Um, so the east side, which I'll just take a quick show of what, the, what it looks like. So this is the view from the east parking lot whenever the Swan Lake is lowered. So in the spring and well, winter through the summer, and the Swan Lake is higher up, especially if the river is high. But in the late summer, they start to drain it just like Chautauqua. They drain it for mostly the ducks. But um, because it's far enough south, whenever they start draining it, there's also like a lot of waders that come in. So you'll see dozens of like little blue herons, and snowy egrets down there too. But then also have a lot of shorebirds. But this is the view from the, the, this east parking lot here where this number three is. So I like going here, like I said, usually in the, in the late summer, and early fall for the shorebirds and the waders. But also there's also a dike that goes along here. This is basically the easiest place to look at the entire lake, even though the lake is super ginormous. I mean, it looks small in here, but it's a, about as big as Lake Peoria. And sometimes even a lot of these pictures, I did in, include some digiscope pictures just because some good birds that we see in these areas are so far out. So for example, this is a eared grebe that I saw a few years ago at this site in the middle of this lake, but there's a cross site, just like Chautauqua, but there's a cross site that separates the river, you can kind of see the road here, but this is basically a cross site that separates the Illinois River from Swan Lake. And you can walk on on any time of year besides, I think, late in the fall because of literally the tens of thousands of ducks that are on the refuge. Um, if you look at the ducks, like, there's a um, duck survey that's ran by the IDNR. If you look at the Mississippi River Flyway in November and December, they'll have like 75 to 100,000 ducks, just like Chautauqua at this refuge. And they're all on this lake and they can all be viewed from this east and most parking lot, actually. So it looks small, but it's actually a very expansive area right here. And there's a couple other areas here that are noteworthy. Like, for example, um, Harris's sparrow is a species that's pretty hard uh, to see, but is on a lot of birders' radars because it's a hard bird to see around here. It's kind of like a great plain species. But every year, or at least every year I've gone down there to bird, I usually find one or two at least. So they're around there, just no one goes down there, so they're, they go undetected a lot easier. At one point, actually on the same levee here, one winter I saw three on this one levee here. But between this levee, number point number four here, which is um, Palman Slough, I've had, that's actually where that picture was taken from, was right here. And then there's actually some, if you guys maybe have heard of Calhoun Peaches, it's a, at least a big thing down where I'm from in Jacksonville and stuff. There would be trucks in the summer of people selling Calhoun Peaches, and they're all from I went back too far. All from down here. Um, there's a bunch of peach or peach tree orchards and stuff, and there's several around here. And there's a lot of white crowned sparrows. I like to be in this area every basically every year, and I found multiple Harris sparrows in that area. But anyways, so the main headquarters are here at seven. Um, I will note that basically everywhere from like seven and eight to the east, which are most of my points here, I know. Uh, but when the rivers are high, basically even the road gets underwater and the Brussels Ferry gets clo becomes closed. Um, this is all very low. It's like a big ridge, like right here, right before the headquarters road. Here you can kind of see on the map, actually, right here. You see the ridge. Um, so basically everywhere in here gets flooded, even when the river is at marginal, river, uh, at marginal flooding. So anyways, um, the headquarters is open once in a while. I won't say it's as open as some other national wildlife refuges. It's in the middle of nowhere. 
I don't want to say there's no point for it to be open every day, but there's not a lot of people that come and visit here. Besides whenever the bald eagles are around, this is the area where a lot of people do go see a, bald e a lot of bald eagles. Dremart, Cat State Park, um, but Grafton area, but also Two Rivers National Wildlife Area. January and February, hundreds of people flock down here, especially from St. Louis, to see a bunch of bald eagles. So that's a cool area to go to. Um, it's a different area to go to and uh, a place almost no one has ever never hears about. So between the sparrows, all the wading and shorebirds on the lakes in late summer and uh, early fall, and then also the tens of thousands of ducks that are later, that are later in the fall. It's a, quite, it's a pretty sight to see. There will also be tens of thousands of snow geese and white fronted geese there in November too. So definitely an interesting sight to uh, go to. And I've seen plenty of good species there. And then also I didn't even mention, so um, Mississippi kites and fish crows are also very common at this refuge in the summer. Oh, very common. They're common at the refuge in the summer. So this is the Mississippi kite that I took when I was um, basically in that east parking lot, actually. So, so that's a Mississippi kite, which we really don't get up here either. So, um, it's far enough south. It's not far than far enough south to get like Carolina chickadee because you have to go to um, like Granite City, East St. Louis to get Carolina chickadee trans over uh, transition over. But it's far enough south to get like Mississippi kite and fish crow and snowy egret and little blue heron reliably. Um, and a few other sites up ahead, I'll talk about some of the southern warblers and yellow crown night heron and some of those species that are there. So this is a nice place to have a mixture between all the water species. You have some mixture with some western species. You have some mixture with some southern species. It's a great area to go to. go to. So another site that I'm going to talk about is Pure Marquette State Park. Basic, uh, basically, I always start the main visitor center right here. There's actually a, I've never stayed at personally, but I know there's a large lodge that I've had multiple friends stay at before. I know it's really nice. Um, but there's a lodge here right next to this number one, which is the main headquarters. And there's actually a lot of visitors at the state park. So the visitor center is open all the time. Um, there, there are a few trails around here. There's an amazing trail just north of the visitor center where you go up on this big bluff and you look over all the, the bottoms of the Illinois River. But then also this is called Scenic Drive because there's multiple overlooks, which I think maybe the next picture. Yeah. So this is the, the Swan Lake I was just talking about. You can see it. All the way across, this is Swan Lake over here. There's multiple overlooks from up here that you're so high up on the cliff, you can see across the river. So this is that Swan, this is the Two Rivers National Wildlife Refuge I was talking about. Um, so there's some beautiful, not just beautiful birding, but there's also beautiful views from the state park as well. Down here in the bottoms, you get fish cove very reliably, and there's a little small marina where there's a lot of gulls and stuff in the winter. It's, the river is very frozen up. And you go up the road. I was just talking, I kind of was alluding to all the overlooks in this part here but uh there's a lot of ravines you start actually make a big climb here right after you pass the visitor center and then there's a lot of ravines and extensive forests where you get a lot of warm eating warblers according to ios jersey county is southern uh, illinois but i still consider it central illinois so to me it's the most or the, the easiest spot in central illinois to get hooded warblers hooded warblers are everywhere in the state park um it's probably the most common breeding warbler species at the state park um, but more, more meeting warblers are very common. Kentucky warblers are very common here. Um, and then I typically, so I start down, I start down here and then go up. Um, I would say the best time here is April and May as well. And there's like, there's actually a large pine forest, which is closed in the winter for some reason. You take a couple turns to get up here. Um, but there's pine warbler and red breast nut hatch. And I've never had red crossbill, but it would be a really good spot for red crossbill if they go south. And a few other species. This is also a very good park to do winter birding. I mean, some of the winter species like brown thrasher and like field sparrow and towhee, like birds that we don't get up here this far north in the winter, they actually overwinter here. They're, this is far enough south to get some of those species. And I've had like at literally at the point four, I had, I found a spotted towhee a couple winters ago. So there's some good birds to be had here. So, and then typically go down Graham Hollow Road, which is on the east side of the park. And that's basically right along Graham Hollow Creek. And then there's like yellow-throated warbler, Louisiana water thrush, and northern perula, and broadwing hawks are usually soaring above the creek. Um, but there's also the only spot in the um, state park to get cerulean warbler, which is actually a tough species there. You would think with it being more south, they're, they're more common there, but actually it's a tough species in the state park itself. I don't, I've only had it once or twice, which the habitat along here is good for. I just never had it. Um, and lastly... There's another small lake that's actually connected to two rivers. It's called Gilbert Lake. It's usually not, um, A, not covered, but B, it's not usually too good. Um, there's been only a couple times where it's been low enough for shorebirds. Uh, you never know. You might see something there. But then also the Brussels Ferry, and I forgot to mention really quick, if you're ever down here, go back really quick. So we have the Brussels Ferry, which is free, but there's also a ferry called Golden Eagle Ferry that goes across the Mississippi. I think it's like $8 cash or something to go across. 
you go across the Mississippi River, you're on the Missouri side. And so having to go all, all the way to go all the way to Alton, which is another hour to cross the river to get into Missouri. So it's something interesting to know if you're ever down. But yeah, so anyways, the Brussels Ferry here goes between Jersey and Calhoun counties, and it's a free ferry. See, it's open, I would say, 90% of the year. It's only closed when the river is very high or the river is like completely frozen solid. So, so I talked about the overlook there. And from that overlook, I know that's really bad, but I was just talking about how sometimes you might be able to spot a bird two miles away at Swan Lake. You never know when that one American flamingo or that one roseate spoonbill might stick out two miles away. Well, on this day, this was an American avocet that stuck out two miles away. You see the white right here. And that's the best digiscope picture I can get because of the heat waves. <laughs> <laughs> but and that was two miles away across on um, not the same day. But I mean, anyways, you can even see like the mud flat and stuff in this picture. But anyways, um, thought that'd be funny to put in there. And then here's just a picture of hooded warbler. Figured out. So that's kind of how the structure of this is going to be tonight. I'll talk about all the spots. And I'll talk about some of the birds that are there and show some pictures I've taken from those locations. So this is a beautiful hooded warbler, which you really don't get here that often. I think I've seen it once at Jubilee College, once or twice maybe. I know it's really tough there. But they're, like I said, it's probably the most common warbler throughout the state park down there. So, and then I think, yeah, so this is me when I was like eight or 10 um, at that Graham Hollow Creek, what I was just talking about. So I have a few pictures from when I was younger just to throw on just for little memories from all these areas. And I was probably pitching with my mouth open like that. But anyways, um, so that's me when I was probably 10-ish. And the second to last spot in this whole region is Stump Lake which now is getting um, more and more renowned because last year one of my friends found uh, yellow crown night herons here and I went down and I saw them and everything. But um, yellow crown night heron is a really tough species in Illinois. And even like the areas like Mermet or Oakwood Bottoms or East St. Louis areas that a lot of people go to see them are now getting very tough. And they were never at Stump Lake until last year. And now this year, there's three or four there from what I was told by some locals from my hometown that just went down last weekend. So um, if you're ever wanting to see yellow crown night heron, I would say come to Stump Lake sometime soon because um, they're very um, they're very gettable there, which is a very tough species to see around here. Um, I'll kind of explain why uh, where to get them in a second. But basically, so we're just north of, you can actually see Pure Marquette State Park right here on the side here. Um, so we're just northwest of Pure Marquette State Park. There's an entrance road, and usually, especially in the late winter, I always stop right off. I right after I get off the Great River. This is the Great River Road here. It's Highway 100, which Highway 100 goes all the way up to Meridosha, all the way up up the Illinois River. So you can just take this beautiful road all the way down anytime you would like. Anyways, a few years ago, I found some golden eagles flying around here in the uh, late winter. And then I think the following winter, I think someone else had one or two around here. But one day I had up to four golden eagles flying around right here, which I have a picture of in a minute. Um, and the multi I think like a few dozen people came down just to get them for the for that year or for their life. Probably a few people probably got as a new life. Bird. But multiple, a lot of people even came down from Chicago just to get the golden eagles here that one year that I had them here. There's two or three that stuck around for like two months, I think. But there's also been plenty of birding. There's a, there's a couple moist soil units that have not in the fall but usually in the winter and the spring it's full of water there's been usually a lot of ducks there's usually a lot of shorebirds of these more so moist soil units um and then you go down and you start getting like the bottom of the forest there's like sloughs so you, there's a lot of pathonotary warblers there's a lot of i have a video which i didn't think i can include a video i could have um but i have a video from basically this point three right here where i have six pileated woodpeckers flying around and calling and stuff um so there's a lot of species that go through there, but also it's important to know if you ever come here and the river is just marginally high, like not even that high, that that entrance road into Stump Lake um, it is usually flooded. And it's pretty noticeable. You'll drive by it. I think yeah, there's a sign, but there's literally, it's the only road that goes off of the Great River Road in this area that's lined with cypress trees. Um, so because it's all lined with cypress trees, there's also a lot of migratory warblers that like to be around there too. Um, and there's a couple other spots south of here. It's just another access point to see the lake. Um, there's, there's usually a lot of pelicans and egrets and gulls and shorebirds in these sloughs later in the summer whenever the river starts to recede. Um, I'm not, I can't remember if I included a picture of it or not, but I have a picture of like a thousand or two egrets in this, or sorry, egrets, a thousand or two pelicans in this small slough all compacted in the slough, feeding on all the dead fish. But there's been like tricolored heron and glossy ibis and birds like that found here in the past. I had like neotropical cormorant a couple times along here, but Definitely an interesting area. It's, it's very heavily duck hunted in the fall and winter, so I advise not to go in the fall and winter here. Um, but it's, well, late fall and winter, but uh, earlier in the fall, it's usually come, it's full with hundreds of wading species. So, and there's like, like I said, the same idea for 
it's another access point here. And this this pot is just uh, an area with pine, or sorry, with prairie warbler and blueing warbler. Which oh, there's better areas for that. I just put that on there just for fun. So that was the yellow crown night here and there. Um, that that was from last year. Um, so this is a unique species because it's pretty uncommon or rare in Illinois. Um, they used to only be in southern Illinois. There's actually like a um, so most wading species have a post breeding dispersal where some of the young come north. So some falls we get young yellow crown night herons that do come this far north. Um, but to see a breeding adult is pretty uncommon. So now since they're actually reliable as far north as this area is important to note for the future. So um, this, that was taken last June, I think, yes. Um, so then also Mississippi kites, and I realize how blurry this picture would be. Um, but this is a juvenile Mississippi kite. So actually Mississippi kites also breed at this site too. So this is a juvenile Mississippi kite from a few years ago. But if you're there in July, anytime midday, you should be able to see plenty of Mississippi kites flying around. So. Aside, this might be the only juvenile I've actually seen in Illinois, so it's kind of cool. Um, and then also found some interesting species as well. This is the golden eagle here, and this is what we presume to be a model duck as well. So you can see the big fat blocks, big fat, I said big fat. The big fat black spot on the gate there is pretty noticeable. I already skipped to the next one. Um, um, so that's what we would presume is a model duck. You can see the big black spot there, but... Definitely some interesting species that we find at the site. So um, this is this is from the bluff, and this is you can sell, see all the ducks. This is from one of the moist solar units whenever you go into the property. So definitely an interesting site. Um, I did not have any pictures of the actual site itself. I guess this one site I didn't even have pictures of, even though I've been to like fifty times. So, anyways, so the last spot in this region to talk about is Copperhead Hollow, which is a spot that no one probably has ever heard of besides like maybe twenty birders, maybe. Uh, my grandfather actually uh, did a bunch of surveys here whenever he was, uh, whenever it was 20 or 30 years ago to see if it was worthy of protecting it. And he found a bunch of hooded warblers here. So that probably sparked some interest of some people. But anyways, um, it's a really good site. Um, I think I have one picture of what it looks like. So um, one of the points I, I have labeled as like a top of a hill, I have nothing else to call it. It's this basically a three mile gravel road that dead ends at the end. You start higher up where you get warm eating warbler and hooded warblers are everywhere. It's kind of like another ravine area with thick forest. And then you kind of come out on this ridge right on top of, a, there's a big creek that you go down to. Um, but this big ridge that overlooks basically miles of area. It's beautiful. It's just taking that first, usually I start here first thing in the morning if I do go down this area. And even this area here, right before you drop, there's always hooded warblers here. I've had Australian warbler actually pretty close to the spot. Um, there's always a lot of sparrows. If you go in the winter, there's a lot of sparrows, a lot of kinglets. There's usually hermit thrushes everywhere, fox sparrows, eastern tokies, all that stuff everywhere. Um, and then you'll drop. This is actually the only picture I could find of the site from my phone as well. Um, but um, you'll drop. I'll go back to the original map. Um, so basically, this is a little small town of Fielden. It's 10 minutes west of Jerseyville. So it's also still in Jersey County. It's only 10 minutes from the Stump Lake. This is all, all these spots are very close together. So this is the, the beginning of Copperhead Hollow. It's a state, it's a fish and wildlife area, technically. Um, so you go from one, and then um, two is about where the, um, the warm-eating warblers, the hooded warblers, are some deep ravines in there uh, for the warm-eating warblers and some other species as well, like I was just mentioning. Three is where, this hill, or where the, the top of the hill is. And there's a steep dr uh, drop off right about where four is. You basically transition from the upland forest. You go through like all this like shrubbery, and then you basically end right before you get to five and like this beautiful shrubland habitat where there's prairie warblers and blue wing warblers and orchard orioles and those species that use those kind of habitats. And then five is like at the end of the parking lot, there's quite a bit of turkey hunting that goes here, like that happens here. Um, there's a couple times where the gate, there's like a gate that's like maybe halfway down the road that's been closed. So that's maybe twice out of the 30 or 40 times I've been there. But overall, it's a very quiet spot. There's never anyone there. Um, there's a lot of warblers that you can see there. Um, I mean, you can tell it's just a gravel road, just this is a one lane gravel road, but there's never anyone there. It's great birding. Um, it's only 20 minutes from Pure Marquette State Park. There's also a lot of warblers that go there. And then also, um, after you get done with the site, you can take Nutwood Road and it's a five mile drive down to Great River Road. And then you can get started on wherever you're going up and down the Great River Road. Um, so there's a lot of Louisiana water thrushes and yellow footed warblers and northern perulas that are usually on this part. Um, of the uh, if you leave Copper and Hollow and go down Nutwood Road to the Great River Road, so just an interesting area to mention as well that no one ever goes to. So, um, anyways, we get started to maybe some areas I might start to become a little more familiar to people. So now I'll talk about the Meridosha area, which I'm oh, 
hitting the wrong button. One of these times I'll get it figured out. Um, so I'm from Jacksonville here, about 20, 30 miles west of Springfield. And this is all Morgan County. So um, we have Meridosha, about where my laser is right now. Um, we'll have Beardstown, which is right up here. And Havana is just up off the top of the screen. Uh, this is Interstate 72 right here. So we have a few places that I'll mention here. Um, so we have Meridosha National Wildlife Refuge right here. This is the first place I'll talk about. There's Silent Stream State Park, which is a large, kind of it's very similar to Pure Marquette. There's a lot of breeding warblers that are there. The old population of Bewick's friend, the only stable population of Bewick's friend used to be there, but it's not reliable anymore. Um, I'll talk about some areas in Brown County, where about seven is. I'll briefly talk about some Chuckles Widows and some marshland species around Beardstown um, and a couple other sites. This is Jim Agri Panther Creek, which is a place where really no one goes besides hunters, but it's also a really good site to see Northern Shrike. Um, and then also talk about Singanoi. So I'll continuously build up the river as we go. Um, anytime I go birding um, around here, it's either we'll go ahead and start at Asylum Springs in the morning and work our way around Meridosha area, or we'll just only stick on the Meridosha area. Because there's a lot of sites that only bird around the Meridosha area. I would say it's maybe an hour and a half from here, two hours maybe at most, but it's probably about an hour and a half. I could probably just hop down maybe 24 and then go, um, this is probably Rushville here, and then probably go down to Beardstown and down. So, um, so that I'll get started with this area. So I, I actually am going to break up Meridosha into two separate sections here. So there's a lot of pinpoints on the map. I know. I'll get to it in a minute. Um, basically, we have Meridosha Lake as a whole, which is a na another national wildlife site itself. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other surrounding sites that I'll talk about as well. But I'll only talk about Meridosha Lake itself first. So there's a headquarters area technically um, at the south end of the lake, but it's just a maintenance shed. There's not actually any, there's not a headquarters here. Technically, all the, what I would call the lower um, Illinois River headquarters or National Wildlife headquarters is all centered at Chautauqua. Chautauqua basically facilitates all, uh, anything that goes on at any of the local National Wildlife refuges at these areas. So that includes Meridosha and then also technically the North and South Globe Tracks are Fish and Wildlife property at Emmerquan. So um, everything is kind of ran out of Chautauqua. So there's no actual headquarters at Meridosha. But at that site, there's an interesting pine forest that we usually get like red breast nut hatches and We've had Red Crossville a couple times. Um, but it's basically if you walk in there, um, there's a parking lot. There's usually like larkspur in the parking lot because it's all sandy. Um, and then it's all these old pine trees, but most of them have been basically fallen over because they're so old. So it's kind of a unique. I don't actually have a picture of it. Uh, once again, um, I was just there last Saturday. But it's an interesting sight just to go in and see some interesting species. I've seen spotted toey a couple times. I've even seen a spotted toey hybrid once there. So. Um, definitely an interesting spot, but I'll get more into the, um, anyways, so this is what the South area, I have a couple points labeled as the South area on that map. So basically first, if you ever go down, especially in the spring, always look at the river level that you can easily look at it through na the national weather service. Um, just cl click on the Lincoln site, then go to the national or the river gauge, uh, the river gauges on the Illinois river. And if the Meridosha river gauge is above 13 feet. Some parts of the road might be underwater, um, but um, really until it's about 15 feet, it should still be ac accessible. But it's flooded very quickly and very easily whenever the river is just marginally high. So if you ever plan to go here in the spring, be careful because it's likely going to be uh, underwater. Even though this year has been dry enough, it hasn't been. So um, this is what a typical view will look like in the fall from that south area. I usually go to, uh, it's kind of hard, I have so many pinpoints in this one spot. Um, but basically, if you come in from the south, you know, eventually you'll go, you'll go by a couple sloughs, you'll go by a couple ponds, across a creek, and then eventually you'll get kind of you'll cross one final slough. It's only like a half a mile after you drop. And there's one small drop, and then you go by these sloughs and stuff. But eventually it'll open up to this beautiful view of the whole south base of the lake. So there'll be a huge, well, if the lake's low, this is all connected to the river. So that's why the water here, if the river's high, the water's high here. The river's low, the water's low here. Um, so this is all mud flat here. There, there'll be, a, it goes all the way around the lake, but there's a huge expanse of mud flat. You can even kind of see a point here at the end. But there's an expanse of mud flat on the south side that we usually see a lot of shorebirds. I have a few pictures here in a minute. And then we have this large basin here that we've seen all three scoters, irid grebe, and neotropic cormor. But even besides the more unusual species, we've seen a lot of duck species and horn grebe and common loon and it's usually thousands of pelicans if you come here in august there's usually a thousand like thousands of pelicans here but also it's very heavily duck hunted so if you do come in the fall 
there will be a lot of shooting going on. There's a lot of duck hunting actually going on at this refuge. So um, a lot of birds actually won't tend to be down here in the fall. Um, there's usually a lot of shorebirds, but there's also a sand spit just to the right of this picture um, that if the pelicans aren't occupying it, it's usually full with gulls and terns. We've seen least terns on it and red knot and some other unique birds on it before. But also, um, in the, especially in the fall, when you have a nice mud flat and everything, you come in the, in the late evening, the sunsets are beautiful here, so as you can see by this picture. So, so this is what the mud flat looks like closer up. Um, for some reason, um, this site specifically is very good for peeps. So peeps are five species of shorebird, uh, shorebirds that are smaller. So we have least, semi-palmated sandpiper, white rump, Bairds and Western. So for some reason, this entire mud flat is always filled with, with least and semi-palmated sandpipers. And sometimes we can get high numbers of Western sandpipers. So these are actually all Western sandpipers. I know the picture's kind of backlit. But actually, a few years ago, I saw, I think it was 29. I can't remember what the number was. But it was the state's second highest count of Western sandpipers. But definitely a unique kind of shorebird diver diversity can be found here um, at this mud flat. Usually, the taller shorebirds don't like it here. I have seen most of them here. Actually, my first mega, I would say not mega, but my first rare find when I was 10 was actually at the site. I found a molting red fire rope one July and it ended up staying two or three days. Um, so a few people got, got to see it. Um, but I ended up, I mean, it's something I don't have a picture of, but it was the first time I ever got stuck in the mud. I ran out uh, trying to get pictures of it because I thought it was such a cool bird. And then I ran out and then uh, I got stuck about, you know, 25 feet from the shoreline and then grandma had to come save me. So very thankful for grandma for saving me. So um, I always have to try and incorporate little stupid stories for me growing up. But the mud, the mud is here. The mud here is very sinky. So uh, you sink very quickly. But it's a beautiful, beautiful site. There's always a lot of birds here. There's usually avocets here too. And um, whenever the, whenever there's mud flats and stuff, there's usually quite a few shorebirds here. Um, so like, just like the Western sandpipers, like I said. Uh, and just like I said about the river flooding. So it floods very easily. This is from the north side. It's so basically neat, the beach road will go right along the east side of the lake until it hits the county line, and then it'll dogleg right when it hits the Cass County line. Um, so this is looking from the county line road on the um, basically the north side of the lake. There is a boat ramp. There's not many access areas to see the lake itself um, besides that south area, and there's one boat ramp, which during duck hunting season, is, there's 20 or 30 trailers full of boats there already. So, um, But all the ducks will end up on the Cass County side, which is viewed from the boat ramp whenever the people are hunting because – the Cass County portion is not hunted for ducks. So, but yeah, I mean, even if the lake's marginally high, this is a very high, this is very high for this picture, but you can see where it's receding even. But I mean, um, this is when the river is very high. So luckily this year has not been high enough to, for it to be close yet, but obviously we just got all this rain recently. So you never know. So, and then that was basically just all, all of those areas up here. Um, so then I'll show pictures and talk about all these other sites. So I'll start with the short, what we call the shorted owl field. This is a bad picture, but it's the only shorted owl picture I had from that site. So usually every Christmas bird count, my grandfather runs a Christmas bird count at Meridosha uh, National Wildlife Refuge. Um, we always end here in the evenings, but one, uh, one year we started first thing in the morning and I ended up finding a snowy owl at the, at the same field as well. So you never know what you'll see around here. Um, but there's this expansive grassland that's, you can see the county line. This is the Cass Morgan line up here. There's a road that runs right along it. Uh, and there's this huge grassland that's up here. There's a lot of Henslow sparrows, lots of sedrange in the late fall. Um, in the winter, there's always a lot of short owls, usually a dozen or two harriers flying around. Sometimes there's western mallarks that are here that are singing in the, like in the spring. Um, there's usually a lot of bobblinks whenever they're coming through. So it's, it's private grassland, but everything's actually doable from the roads. So um, definitely an interesting site. Um, the next major area is this where this tent is. It's called Four Corners. I never really understood where the name Four Corners came from, but it's this basically this large flooded area that, oh, okay, I guess I very quickly had put that picture in there. Um, but there's a lot between that site and Four Corners, there's a lot of um, Eastern Bluebird boxes, which Eurasian tree sparrows nest in. So obviously, Eurasian tree sparrows like our house sparrow, but it's very range restricted to. Um, the central U.S. were, since they were released in St. Louis about 150 years ago, they look just like the house sparrow. They actually are expanding now over the last 10 years. But even, even people come across the country to add Eurasian tree sparrow to the United States less. So this area, basically anywhere around Meridosha, but specifically between 8 and 9, basically between 8 and 10, about where 9 is. 9 is where 
There's a bunch of moist soil units that used to be really good. So I got my life for yellow rail, but now it's all grown up. But basically where nine is, um, there's a bunch of eastern bluebird boxes where you can find Eurasian tree sparrows nesting in the summer. There's usually a lot of tree swallows around those areas. But then also, um, there's also, because this is very sandy soil, there's a few different snake species if anyone's interested in snakes. Um, there's a different hog nose, which I don't know if I put the picture in here yet, but I think it's western or plains hog nose, one of the two. Or prairie. But there's a different hog nose species that you can find there. It's, um, they've seen it a couple of times. Uh, but yeah, so anyways, this is a Eurasian tree sparrow feeding some feeding a young at that same site. So looks just like the house sparrow. If anyone does not know how to identify a Eurasian tree sparrow, looks just like a house sparrow. But it has this black cheek patch, and you can see it coming in on the on the young. Um, but it has a completely brown cap instead of a house sparrow. We even have gray in the middle of the brown cap. Anyways, here's that four corner site I was talking about. It's basically just flooded um, flooded areas. I'm assuming it's because there's a um, there's a creek that's levied up right next to it that I think the water just somehow seeps under. There are a few pipes that go from the, from the creek into this area. So I think the water, whenever the river tide just goes to the site. Um, sometimes it's passable and sometimes it's not passable. And this is only happens whenever the river is high. Like this can even happen whenever the river is semi-high, but for a long period of time because the water just eventually just, cut, just pours into the site. And we've seen lots of different species here. It's usually really good for shorebirds. It's completely dry right now. It'll always be like, oh, go to Four Corners right now. It's completely dry as of Saturday. So um, it's not good this year anyways. We've had all the shorebirds from Godwits to redneck phalaropes to turnstones and western sandpipers and stuff in the summer or in the spring. There's usually blackneck stilts nesting here every year. Um, usually if anywhere else is dry, blackneck stilts were only nest in Emiquan. But if, uh, if this site's um, wet, it's probably the only other spot in the state where blackneck stilts were actually nest. So uh, multiple blackneck stilts can be found nesting here when the water's high. Uh, there's usually pied grebes everywhere, American coots nesting here. There's usually common gallon rules and least bitterns and king rails that nest here actually some of the most reliable spots for king rail. But also even during the migration season, we can actually get some Swainson's hawks like Pete just mentioned earlier about finding rare. I've had a few Swainson's hawks flying around here and also a lot of yellow-headed blackbirds can be found during migration been multiple times I've had three or four yellowhead blackbirds at once in April just because it's a wet site right next to the river and they'll drop in. Um, so that's what that site looks like. Here's a picture of a blackneck still from that site. It's a bird you can go down in Imaquan and see all the time, um, but it's another spot in Illinois you can see blackneck still when it's flooded. So um, and here's a picture of a black tern. There's usually a lot of black terns in mid to late May here. Here's a good site for them as well. And here's a picture of a king rail from a few years ago um, that was calling along the side of I think, I think that's uh, Towhead Road. But anyways, yeah, it just came out right off the side of the road and it was just calling right next to the road. So, um, so it was definitely interesting. And ever since then, I'd never really had luck. This was four years ago. I never had had luck with King Rail until four years ago. But every year since it's flooded since, I've had King Rail there. So it's an interesting site. It's, well, the fields themselves aren't public. But I mean, since the roads basically go right through the flooded fields, it's very easy to access and see all the birds up close. So definitely a fun site to go to. And just south of there, there are a few, what I would call industrialized areas. Um, so south of Meridosha, there's a few large, I don't know what they And there's a large power plant, but there's a few other large companies that just have warehouses and stuff there. But um, because of that, there's a lot of grasslands around there because of sandier soil. There's a few other different species that are there. Not specifically Bob White with sandier soil, but there's a lot of grasslands that are around there. So there's a lot of Bob Whites, there's a lot of grasshopper sparrows, there's one of the state's only spots for Western kingbirds are, are, is at that site too. Um, there's one spot in particular, I go back to that. I should have put that in there twice. Um, so this, these areas are all south of Meridosha. Uh, I'll very briefly mention there's a, whenever the river's high, there also are some good flooded fields along Highway 67 as well. And the bluffs can be very good for birding as well. We've had Red Crosswell this spot a couple of times. Um, there's some nice pine forests up here. But anyways, back to down here. Um, so this is just south of Meridosha. This is the Scott Morgan County line down here. There's a couple of private lakes down here. They can be good for birding, but they're mostly private. So I usually tell people not to go to them. But this whole area is all basically shrubland and grassland. So it's all northern bobwhites and yellow-breasted chats and bells of Urios and northern mockingbirds, kind of that species group. They can just find just driving around with your windows down on any summer day. I had a scissor tail flycatcher once um, near one of the Western Kingbird sites, but the most reliable one is on Cemetery Road 
right on the county line. There's a little tiny substation right next to some railroad tracks. And I've had Western Cambridge nest there for, I think, maybe five years in a row now. Um, I don't think they're there yet, but they should be there soon. Uh, anyways, so that's kind of that area there. So I'll talk about, so there's obviously this picture was taken on that cemetery road a few years ago. So this is a male northern bobwhite that are very thick in there. Um, this is the Western Cambridge also taken from cemetery road. It's, it's kind of what I call a twofer because they nest in Scott County, but they usually perch on the Morgan County side of the road. So um, you can get it in two counties. <laughs> um, but anyway, so you got Western Cambridge, which only nests in three locations in the state, at least reliably nests in three locations in the state. One's in East St. Louis. Well, there's kind of a broad area between Grant City and East St. Louis that multiple pairs nest. Um, the Meridot just south of Meridosha, which we found only about seven years ago or so. One late summer day, we found um, – a pair with four young and it was like, well, I, we did not know they nested here and they've nested there ever since. So, um, and I've had up to three pairs there once, but I think last year I only had one or two. And then also just south of Havana, which I'll talk about. Um, those are the three main sites for Western Cambridge in Illinois. So next to the, on to the next site, this is a lot of points. I'll break it down very simply. So basically this is Asylum Springs State Park. It's between Brown and Adams County, Illinois. So it's about 30, 40 minutes east of Quincy, um, or about or about 30 minutes west of Meridosha, or Mount Sterling is about 15 minutes just to the northwest or northeast of there, which you can basically take 24 from here straight to Mount Sterling. It's only 15 minutes from Mount Sterling. So basically this is, I mean, I have several points in here, but this, to put it, just to put it very simply, there's the east entrance road and there's multiple spots on the east entrance road that are worth for birding. There is some spots for prairie warbler and some spots for bluing warbler, which is basically what these earlier sites are. Number three, right when you first turn on the, this is basically the entire east entrance road here. Um, number three is the most recent reliable spot for B. rex wren, which is a species that a lot of people are looking for. It's technically state endangered, but although there's not been any recorded breeding ones in this county specifically, there was a pair in Schuyler County in 2021. Uh, my grandfather saw one as a one, photographed one as a one day wonder last year at the same site, but we haven't seen any nesting there since 2014. Um, but it used to be a species a lot of people would like to see. Um, it's a species that's common out west. It's very interesting because it's, there's a different subspecies that can only be found like in Iowa and Illinois, maybe Missouri. Um, it's, the, it's, it's the eastern Buick wren, which is um, under threat because of house wrens. Actually, house wrens terrorize Buick wrens. So it's kind of led to their decline. Um, but anyways, we got very quickly, there's the buckhorn unit, which used to be very reliable for Chuckles Widow. Um, but in the last two or three years, um, they've been very tough there. I know my grandfather did not get it on the spring bird count on Saturday there. Um, but it used to be really reliable for Ch Chuckles Widow. But this entire, technically the western part of Brown County, but the eastern side of Silent Spring State Park is full of eastern whippoorwills. If you just drive with your window down one evening and just drive all these roads right by Silent Springs, you'll probably hear 20 or 30 whippoorwills calling at night. Um, you can do the same thing at Sand Ridge, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But this is probably the only other spot in the state besides Sand Ridge, you can just drive around with your windows down and hear 20 or 30 whippoorwills calling at night, which is something a lot of us don't get anymore because they've declined. So basically this eastern entrance road, like I said, there's multiple points on here, but they're basically all corresponding to spots for prairie warblers and blue wing warblers. And there's a couple of prairies you can get like bob white and some bob links we can get uh, as migrants. But also you'll finally eventually enter the park, which there should be, this is what it'll look like whenever you enter the park on the eastern entrance road. I like going there in the fall too, not specific, specifically for birding, because birding in the fall is kind of okay there. But the fall colors, which I think I have another picture nest, the fall, the fall colors are beautiful. Um, I think this is from October of last year. But this is what it'll look like whenever you enter the park, which is right about here, right before this point six. And right after you pass the sign, if you do come here, you'll very quickly be, uh, get into a very, ex very extensive, I mean, you'll get into an extensive forest with multiple ravines. And right, literally right after you enter the park, there's a few spots for warm eating warbler as soon as you enter the park. Um, as well as, you know, like there's Kentucky warblers everywhere and oven birds are everywhere. Um, both tanager species are everywhere and um, basically this entire stretch. But there's a few ravines earlier on that are good for warm eating warbler. And then you'll enter actually a, a complete, what I would call a complete evergreen forest. So there's usually oven, like again, oven birds and Kentucky warblers are everywhere. There's usually pine warblers nesting. I suspect that maybe even black bull cuckoo might even be nesting this part of the park. Um, but there's broad hawks that are there, but it's also very good for migratory warblers in this eastern section here. 
that's mostly pine forests. But then you'll eventually cross into the Adams County side. The main headquarters are where Nine is. Um, there's a headquarters side. There's a lot of people that go and camp there. So there's a lot of people that camp at the state uh, at the state park. There's this large lake here. It's called Crab Apple Lake. Um, there's a convenience store that's down here at the at the dam of the Crab Apple Lake that usually has not just food and snacks and drinks and stuff, but also has a lot of hummingbird feeders. So you can go in May and there's usually five or 10 hummingbird feeders set up. You can go see a lot of hummingbirds. At least last time I went two or three years ago, there still were. When I was growing up, we used to go there just to get hummingbird for the day. But it's a beautiful view of the lake. Um, but, the, but where Nine is, there's also a large maintenance shed where Buick's friend used to come to every year, but they have it again since 20. Same year, same year they dropped here, they also dropped there. So we had two pairs in 2014 at each spot, and then we haven't had any since. Um, the next year in 2015, we had them at 10, which 10 is this area where you basically, you don't go to the lake, you keep going straight, and it drops into this, it's probably my favorite part of Siam Spring State Park. Um, you drop into this creek bottom, and there's like yellow-throated warblers and Louisiana water thrush. It's usually where we get Australian warbler if we do, um, but although they're pretty tough there, those are usually a lot of migrants. It's usually where we get morning warbler if they're coming through an alder flycatcher and that kind of thing. It's kind of like it's near the creek, but there's also like a couple ponds to kind of make it look a little swampier. And there's a few spots where prairie warblers right about, you'll make the T right before you get to the headquarters. There's a couple spots where prairie warblers up here. There's lark sparrow up here at the top. Um, there's usually lark sparrow up here. Um, but just some interesting areas. It's an interesting state park that not a lot of people go to. Um, there's most of the breeding, uh, most of the warblers breed there. Uh, my grandfather said from the spring bird count that there's a lot of hooded warblers, which usually in the past we hardly got hooded warblers to the state park. So if you go there, maybe you'll see some hooded warblers because it's something we didn't used to see until maybe this year. And that's basically the gist of the state park. So I have a couple pictures. I already talked about the foliage of this park. His blue wing warbler is one of the species that breeds outside the park. I think a couple probably breed inside the park. But on that eastern entrance road, there's a few spots where we can get blue wing warbler breeding. Uh, which is a beautiful warbler and can be kind of uncommon. And then here's a warm eating warbler that I took at that state park. So, which is a very hard warbler to get. Um, but hey, it sounds like a chipping sparrow, so it can be tough to tough, tough to identify. But it, whenever you see it, I know it looks like a brown bird, but it's pretty. It's pretty in, in person. So, but anyways, this is one of my favorite warblers. So, uh, and here's just a picture I found. I'm, I was trying to find pictures from each spot. So this is one of the only pictures I found from Simon's Spring. This is a morning warbler. That I, Oh, well, there's me. I didn't mean to go ahead. I didn't mean to go ahead yet, but um, this is a male morning warbler from one of the big days we did. We used to start our big days. Uh, once a year, we had tried to do a mini big day. We usually start at Silent Spring State Park. This is from one of our big days that we ran uh, like probably 10 years ago. And then there's me with, um, there's no one in the room tonight here. There's most of these people are from Chicago. Uh, my friend Beth Chato is from Champaign here, um, but most of these people are from Chicago. This is from a Illinois Ornithological Society trip probably 10 years ago that uh, my grandfather uh, and his friend and I kind of helped lead throughout the state park. We were looking for, this is the Bewick's Friends spot, actually. We were looking for Bewick's Friends here, and we did get them on the day. So it had to have been, I had to have been at least 13 because we last had them in 2014. So, but yeah, there's a little me there. So and then I'll very quickly cover the other side of Brown County, which is basically Meridosha. Again, this is the northern part of Meridosha here, a lake here. So um, just north of Meridosha, but on the other side of the river. Big Lake is technically an IDOT property, but it's private. Um, we have access to go in there. You can sometimes see some of it from the road. I won't get into it too much, but whenever the river is high, all these fields right by Big Lake flood, and we've had pretty much all the shorebirds at them whenever the river is high. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that because I've, I've been talking about shorebirds a lot tonight. Um, but there's multiple areas along. There's a beautiful bluff road here um, that's great to bird. A lot of warblers can be found along here, but there's also a spot called Spunky Bottoms. I know it's a weird name. I don't know who came up with it, but it used to be a, this pristine wetland habitat 15 or 20 years ago. Well, 30 years ago, it was a cornfield. Then it was a large wetland. And then about 10 years ago, there was a hole in the levee that got blown from one of the floods. And now it just goes up and down with the river. So there's been a lot of um, encroachment from willows. So even from the bluff road, you can't really see it anymore. But because of the, the blowout in the levee, well, A, the, river, the road floods pretty easily, but B, whenever the river is moderately high, there's now an agriculture field on the north side that floods very easily, and there's usually tens of thousands of ducks whenever it's high. We've seen a lot of shorebirds there. So 
even if the river's high, there's a few places along here that can be good for birding. I'll get into some pictures here in a minute. So here's that big lake property I was talking about. You can see all the egrets here in the water. Is, you can tell the river just gone down, but you can see the thousands, not thousands, but hundreds of egrets here. Uh, there's me when I was super young. Um, whenever the shore birding used to be good, they're actually, this big lake spot used to be more open. And back about 10 or 12 years ago, it actually went up and down with the river. Now it stabilizes at a certain height. But we, um, one year, um, one of my friends found a rough here. I didn't end up seeing it, but um, there used to be a lot of shorebirds here, but I was just showing another picture from younger. One summer, my, uh, Tony, my grandfather, and I were driving along, and he screams, Ibis. And then sure enough, these four white, juvenile white Ibis flew right off from the next to the road. Uh, this species is typically found in the southern U.S. It's only the second time I'd ever seen it in Illinois. But you never know what you'll just see just driving around um, the lake on a day. So just an interesting species that you might not be aware of that's in central Illinois in late, in late summer. And there's a lot of little blue herons here. It's another place in central Illinois. A lot of this entire Brown County area gets dozens of little blue herons in the fall um, with that post-breeding surge from probably St. Louis. This is that spunky bottom site I was talking about. There's a lot of egrets you can see here. This is all because the river went down very quickly. And there's usually a lot of egrets, a lot of shorebirds that can be found here. But a lot of, a lot of times it can end up being practically dry. This all used to be uh, a large marsh. We used to get like Lee Spitrin and King Rail and Common Gallon nesting here 15 years ago whenever I was starting to bird. But that quickly faded away with the blow on the levee. You can see all the willows growing up in the background. So now it's almost just a willow forest that surrounds this lake that goes up and down. So it's not too good anymore. But hey, some year you never know. It might be good again. And then a few years ago, this is very bad picture. But a few years ago, um, my friend Bob Randall called me after school one day and was like, I have a tufted duck. And I ran over and I refound the tufted duck. And then maybe people in this room maybe even went and saw this bird. But yeah, this was also at that spunky bottom site. So again, you never know. Some of these areas that are not birded that much anymore, good birds have been found in the past. So you never know until you go look. But definitely, uh, definitely, it looks just like a lesser. So these are lesser Scott. This bird is probably a mile out when, the, when I took the picture. Uh, so it looks just like a lesser Scott, but has black on the back. As you can see the little tuft on the right here. You can see the little, the little tuft on the back end of the head. Uh, but this is native to Eurasia. But just an interesting bird that was found there. Here's some marble godwits. Uh, for some reason, almost every year whenever the habitat's right, I usually find marble godwits here for some reason. Um, um, I don't know why, but I usually do. But uh, these are also very far out. But just another picture I found from that site. Uh, when I was super young, I was interviewed for a small TV show out of Springfield. And this is at the same site at Smoky Bottoms. You can see all the pelicans in the background. There's usually a lot of pelicans that end up here. But yeah, that was just, again, just a little me. I just keep putting little pictures in here. Just to... And then also the bluffs can be very good for warblers. Um, this is a northern perula. But... The bluffs right next to this, all these sites, there's usually northern perulas, yellow-footed warblers, Kentucky warblers, and stuff, and all over these bluffs. So just another interesting site to bird. So these will go very quick because these are all very small sites. So we have Beardstown, Illinois, which is in Cass County. There's this one lake right across the river from Beardstown that ended up being good last year. I just figured I would just put it on the map. It's never usually good, but there's a lot of shorebirds here last year. There's a little pull-off right next to the bridge here. Last year, was thousands of shorebirds end up being there. But the main idea of this is the Beardstown Marsh, which is private, but is very good roadside birding. Those king rails and lease bitterns and those species that nest there. Soar and Virginia rails are very common right now. Uh, there's been times I've gone to the southern end, about where point three is. So basically, you'll get off the highway here. There's a, the high school is right here. You'll get off the highway and take a left. And then the first part of the marsh, you'll see the marsh is like on both sides of the road. Like up there is good for like common gallino. There's some mute swans at that site. Um, there's usually quite a few ducks. Um, but you'll go down a little bit. You'll pass a, um, I think it's a nursing home or maybe a, and then there's like a little gravel pull in on the right side of the road right after the nursing home. I always pull in there. That's where I get my least bitterns and my king rails and that, those kind of species there. And then you go down just a little bit more. And you'll get to this little creek that crosses the road. And I usually always stop there and that's where I, at least when the water's at the right levels in the spring, it's usually at least a dozen or two sores will be calling. There'll be a lot of Virginia rails. It's usually where a lot of marsh runs will be. And they'll, they can be found all throughout the site, but for some reason, that south end of the marsh, for some reason, they're always very common down there. 
and all these are sometimes American bittern. And then just south of the marsh is a large grass and it's where there's usually a lot of Hensel sparrows singing too, and sedrens and grasshoppers. Grasshopper sparrows I've heard even around the, like on the eastern end of the marsh. But definitely just, I mean, it's only about a mile, mile half stretch, but you can see, see and hear a bunch of different marsh species, but also hear a lot of grass on species. If you, I don't have it on the map, but if you continue the road on down, you get into more sandier soils again, and there's some more shrub and habitats. So you, there's a lot of orchard orioles and yellow breasted chats. But also, there's, it's probably one of the best areas in the state to see lark sparrow, which is just below the map here. Um, and lastly here, there's a little, well, there's a little slough on the highway here, which can be very good for shorebirds. I usually see the shorebirds are here. It's a good spot to see western sandpiper. But anyways, the last key spot here is this on Aaron's Lane. Um, so I, I can't remember who specifically found these about, I don't know, probably eight years ago. But it's one of the only sites, well, maybe even right now, the only reliable site in Central Line to hear Chuckwell's Widow. So it's about two or three miles east of Beardstown. Uh, you'll pass the Arnsville Road. You'll pass the Walmart. There's a large Walmart right here. And then one of the next roads you'll go down is Arms Lane. And you'll go down about a mile or two miles. But before you get to Dog Leg, and you'll just stop the car. And right at sunset or right at sunrise, there should be Chuckwell's Widow. At least one. I've heard two or three there multiple times. Uh, but Chuckwell's Widow will be there. And Eastern Whipper Will will be calling. Uh, usually yellow breast chat and uh, woodcocks are calling there. But it's a, it's a I said, it's probably the only reliable spot anymore to get Chuckles Widow in Illinois since the Brown County site's not producing them anymore. But definitely a interesting, between, since these are all five minutes apart, it's definitely a very interesting species list if you just go one afternoon to all these areas. And here's, well, also I've had a couple of times I've had black belly whistling duck in this area as well. So that could be a species that's nesting around there. I've had black belly whistling duck on three different occasions around this area. So this is from actually last year, last April. I was just randomly driving about right on Orangeville Road right here. And I was just driving and I saw it fly out of the cemetery and just landed right next to the highway. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And it wasn't, there was no water or anything, but we've had it at the marsh a couple times. But that year I just randomly just had it at sunrise one morning when I was driving on Orangeville Road. So they're nesting maybe around there somewhere. You never know. Um, but I've had whistling ducks there a few different occasions. And there's that, this is a kind of a bad picture, but this is what this slough will look like. It's a highway, so it's hard to pull off. There's a couple pull-ins uh, right before the slough that you can walk along and see. Oh, now I'm going back. But you can see all the shorebirds here whenever the slough does go low. I've had western sandpiper here a lot. Um, buff breasted sandpiper here a few times. But um, it's, it's an interesting spot that no one probably looks at until... You never know when the one bird will drop it, but there can be a lot of birds at this site. You can see all the shorebirds here. And that was a really bad picture, but you can see there was thousands of pelicans here last year. I don't know why I included this specific picture, but this is the only one I found. Um, but that picture was this site uh, whenever you cross the bridge on the other side of Beardstown. So last year, there was thousands of pelicans there. They ended up being this species as well. This is super distant, but this is another marble godwit. Last year, it was, I think, maybe the first record for Skylar County, maybe at least an e-bird. I don't know. Um, you can see all the shorebirds around it. But that was like the first time I had gone low in like 10 years, or at least eight or 10 years, at least what I've seen. So that could be something just to know whenever you're going over the bridge of Beardstown and the river's low. Oh, maybe you can just see if there's a bunch of pelicans and shorebirds and stuff. Because last year, there was like 5,000 pel 5, pelicans ended up being here. Anyways, so very quickly, this is also a very quick spot. The main specific reason is the northern shrikes that overwinter Jim Edgar and warm eating warblers that are over at the site over here. Um, there's a very small road. It's called Hickory Road. So bas basically, this is halfway between Beardstown's over here and Chandlerville's over here. So this is an, and if, basically, if you take 78 up, it's another 30 minutes in Havana. Uh, but Hickory Road over here in northern Cass County is probably, well, I know there's a site in Fulton County, but one of the only sites along the Illinois River to get warm eating warbler. There's multiple pairs of the site. Um, I've had hooded warbler once, but there's usually a lot of Kentucky warblers, a lot of Louisiana water thrushes, a lot of yellow-throated warblers, that kind of mix again. But it's a nice road just to go bird in one morning. Um, but Jim Edgar is a very heavily hunted spot, so sometimes it's not good for birding. But especially in February and March, there's usually, I, don't, I would almost label, label it as the state's best place to see a northern shrike. There's usually, I've seen up to three in one morning. It's a species a lot of people like to see. Um, there's also usually like a lot of pheasants that hang around. I've had shorted out there a few times. Hensel sparrows and sedrons nest here very uh, commonly in the late summer. It's, there's usually American woodcocks and yellow-breasted chats are everywhere at the site. So 
it's an interesting site. It's mostly a prairie and upland, I don't almost label upland savanna type of site. It's not a lot of forest, but it's mostly grasslands and shrublands. So you got a unique bird diversity here. There's a couple of lakes, but the lakes usually aren't too good for birding. But it's a really good site to um, go for uh, northern strikes, especially in the central section here. So there's a very bad picture. The only bad picture, the only picture I could find of a northern strike I've taken there, even though I've seen multiple there. They has a northern strike there. So now we're starting to get a little bit more north. So we're getting into Mason County. So basically, I'm just going to cover areas around Havana, and then we'll call it a night. So um, this is Saginaw. So this is probably one of the hardest to get into areas, and maybe even in Illinois, it takes a good 20 or 30 minutes to go about five miles here. But the birding can be very good. I will say do not go here in the late fall because there are dozens, if not hundreds, of people that are that duck hunt here. But that was also the the very the first slide, the sunset on the first slide was also from this site. So by the time you make it all the way out, the headquarters are here. This is technically well, it's called Barkhausen on um the duck surveys, it's called Cuba Island. You'll see there's a lot of ducks that are found here on the duck surveys, but it's Technically not publicly accessed, but it can be very good for birds. But the main entrance road is over here. You come straight off of 78, drive about 10 miles off of I-78. The main headquarters is here, and then it's about a five-mile drive all the way to the back. It's just a one-lane gravel road. With all the duck hunters that go back there, it's not uh, a bad road by any means, but it just takes a long time because it's multiple tri twists and turns. Um, it's just like a one like. And I also said it's a one lane road. So if you come across people, you have to stop and let them go by. But in, in that drive, it's all bottom and forest. It does flood very easily since it's all river bottoms. So in the spring, it's almost always flooded. But there's a lot of pythonic terry warblers. There's a lot of pileated woodpeckers. There's a lot of red headed woodpeckers, that whole mix. And then the winter, there's a lot of winter wrens. There's actually, for some reason, a lot of purple finches for some reason. There must be a, I can't remember what the, the what the, tree composition is there, but there must be a, some sort of seed tree that's a tree that produces a lot of seeds for a lot of purple finches to be around. But once you make it all the way out to the end, you'll, you'll, there'll be a few sloughs that along, that'll run along the side of the road, but you'll eventually get to the main parking area here for Chain Lake, and then it'll be this cross site that goes west of the parking lot, and there's two different pools that basically go up and down with the river. The bottom one, actually, they pump out, but the north one is actually directly connected to the river. And you can kind of see all the mud flats here. There can be, whenever they're not duck hunting, there can be a lot of ducks here. I think maybe that's when it says I can't go further. Oh, it does. Okay. Last time that popped up, but it didn't show I was able to go forward. But anyways, so there's a lot of shorebirds that use this site. Um, last, uh, there's been also a few rare birds that have been found here. One year we did our uh, Illinois Ornithological Society hold a big sit every year. One year we did our big sit. So this is just the view of our big sit. You can see all the expansive mud flats this we were technically just to the right of this picture this is all mud flats here so it's all very good for shorebirds this is just a picture from there itself as a female purple finch from that entrance road um, that i had in one of the christmas counts one of my friends pat ward runs the christmas count at this site so whenever i'm at home for christmas or during that time i usually do this christmas bird count it's very fun that was taken from a christmas bird count on the entrance road Last year, one of my duck hunting friends from my hometown found this limpkin there on the entrance road. Um, I got a random text that was actually birding at Clinton Lake uh, an afternoon. I think it was right before school started last August, or sometime in that time frame. And he, he sends me this picture. He's like, is this a, what is this? And I'm like, that's a limpkin. I'm like, what, are you, what is this doing here? So limpkin have been recently increasing into the Midwest. We don't know why. Is this, we're assuming because of an invasive apple snail, which they aren't, I don't think they're here yet. But um Limpkins never used to really be, they, they never really used to vagrate until two or three years ago. Now we've had several records every year in Illinois. So it's an interesting species. If maybe sometime you see a, wee, a weird heron-like bird that looks like this, keep in mind because they're, they're becoming more and more common. So you never know what you'll find. So this was found there last year, right, along, right alongside the entrance road. So. And a few years ago, I found this pair of juvenile white ibises there at, at that chain lake spot. There's usually hundreds of egrets that will be there, so you never know what you'll see with egrets. There's usually a lot of shorebirds that are there as well. And on that same cross site, for some reason, some of the good sparrows can be found there as well. So um, this one year we had uh, Nelsons and Lacant sparrows along the cross site there in multiple numbers of them around. There's a, another good picture of the Nelson sparrow as well. So, so 
Lastly, I'll talk about the Havana area. I'm assuming most people have at least been in the Havana area in this room, or at least have heard of the Havana area. So I, I mean, I have a lot more pictures from this area, but I won't spend a lot of time talking about all the sites there because some of the sites might be a little more well known. So basically, I'll talk about Anderson Lake, I'll talk about Emmerquan, I'll talk about Havana, just south of Havana, Chautauqua, and Sand Ridge. So very quickly, another very quick spot. Anderson Lake is about 10 or 15 minutes south of Emmaquan. Not a lot of people go there. It's this large lake. It's mostly in Fulton County. It's kind of in Schuyler County. You can see the county line here. But it's this large lake, which is duck hunted very frequently. So not a lot of ducks can be found on it, in the, at least in the fall and winter. But there's this also this impoundment on the south side. Oh, I'm clicking a little too much. Um, this is impoundment on the south side that is lowered and can be very good for shorebirds. I mean, I've seen most of the shorebirds here. I've seen piping plover here once. See most godwits here and other various shorebirds, but when it is lowered, it can be very good for shorebirds. It's the, it's actually technically Fulton. Just the very far southern part is in Schuyler, but whenever it lowers, it's not technically in Schuyler County. It's so you just pull into Anderson Lake and you just keep going south on the road, and then you'll get this is basically there's like a little there's a little cross dike right here, and this is basically from that cross dike. There's a lot of people that camp there. Yes, and especially whenever you go uh, across the cross lake to the back end of the woods, it's usually like, it's kind of like the bottleneck species again. So, like the Prothontary warblers and the, all the woodpeckers, that kind of thing. That's what I mean. There's a lot of redheaded woodpeckers there. There's always redheaded woodpeckers all up and down the campground there. That's just a picture from there as well. Um, and then, very quickly, I don't have a picture of it, but there's also, I was going to briefly mention there's a site that friend usually has northern strike every almost every year just to the west of there so this is you know you know where the pheasant farm is right the pheasant farm oh, yeah. yes so that okay i meant to do the laser okay so the pheasant farm is literally right here so the the main buildings for the pheasant farm the north side and there's the road that goes south it goes south and basically along that road is where the strike can i don't know if he had it last year but like almost every year is where pat has it so at least, and I've had it there multiple times. So sometimes we've had it, you know, and there's a few trees that are along creeks in here. We've had it as far, you know, as far east as over here. Is, we've also had two or three snowy owls in this little section over the last 10 years. Yeah, so it's, it's in that same area. So this al along that road that goes straight south of the pheasant farm is usually where it hangs out. But it can be seen where that snowy owl has been seen in the past. So I figured I would just mention that very briefly. So very quickly, I sit here quickly, but Amaquan, I'm not going to get into all the spots. I, I'm assuming most of the people here have probably at least heard of or have been to Amaquan. It's a very renowned site. I'm probably just going to go spot by spot based off the pictures, because I actually have pictures of most of the spots here. But basically, when I go birding here, uh, if the river's high, I'll do uh, Curless Road first, which is a lot of, there's a lot of flooded areas here. But just in general, I'll bird the, this is all Thompson Lake right here. I did not want to show on the map, because it's quote, too new, even though it's 10 years old, 10, 15 years old. This is all Thompson Lake. There's a big levee that goes all around Thompson Lake, but technically it's off access to the public. I just figured that's why I have number 10 there. I just figured I would mention that the levee there is off access to the public. But there's a few pull-offs along Highway 78 here. That you can see the south side of the lake. There's an observation tower. If you keep going up, there's a boat ramp and an observation tower, which I'll pictures of in a minute. Um, they can just view the north side of the lake. And then there's two impoundments here. They're called the North and South uh, Globe Units. They're technically National Wildlife Properties. are actually not a part of the same, because I think technically this is Nature Conservancy, as Emmaquan, as Thompson Lake. But actually, this is a National Wildlife Refuge property. And then finally, the Dixon Mountains Museum is a great spot, not even to learn about Na Native American uh, culture, but there's also like Yellow Third Warblers and Nests in the camp in the, at the site. There's also plenty of picnic tables there that you can have like a nice picnic lunch and stuff for the day. So usually when I'm having a leading groups there for shorebird trips, I usually go to Dixon Mountains to have a nice picnic, picnic lunch for the day. So I'll very quickly go through Emiquan. This is just that first pen I had. You never know what you'll find in a flock of gulls. We had a white-faced ibis this one time and a flock of gulls on that Curlis Road site. Just pick the odd one out. <laughs> I don't know what he was doing this day. I've never had an ibis with a group of gulls, but that was, well, with white-faced ibis with a group of gulls, but that was interesting. Another site that used to be very good is the Wilder Track. When I was growing up, this used to be the main shorebird site, but now it's very grown up. And unless the river's high, it's usually not too good. Um, when the river's higher up, there can be some mud flats just east of the or just west of the parking lot, but it's very limited. 
And the, the pull-offs along the highway, for some reason I did not have a picture of these, but I included pictures of birds I've seen from them. Um, so this is an American veteran that ended up, we were on one of the pull-offs that go off down from the highway and the lake was high enough where the water almost went to the pull-off itself. And we had this American veteran one day just calling from the edges of the pull-off, basically. And this was probably eight years ago. And this picture is on my room. And I know I've had the picture for six or seven years at least. So, And then also a few times, uh, or at least sometimes, Thompson Lake can be lower. And at least the Pump House Road pull-off, which is the northmost pull-off there, there's usually a spit or two that go out where a lot of gulls and shorebirds like to roost. Um, that's only when the lake is low. So last, I think this was, might have been two years ago. But a few years ago, I had a, a couple of breeding plumage ready turnstones on it. But because it's so rocky, some of the more unique shorebirds like to show up at that spot. So I, it's a beautiful picture from that spot. So I figured I'd include that. But I mean, these pictures aren't specifically from that day, but I was crawling around in the mud in that day. And this is just to show sometimes out. And I figured I would preface this because I have some more shorebird pictures coming up. Um, I didn't just get this from the car. Usually I'm crawling around in mud to get these pictures. These are from my trip from North Dakota, a work trip from North Dakota and Montana a few years ago. Uh, but usually to get shorter pictures, I'm crawling around in mud like this. So don't try this at home. But this is sometimes what I have to do to get some of the shorter pictures. So I figured I would show this. This is actually mostly a flock of all breeding plumage redneck power ups, actually. But anyways, you can see how muddy I was in this picture. It's usually how I look after I get pictures like these. So anyways... So then sometimes birds can be a million miles on Thompson Lake. This is a neotropical cormorant. You can see it's half the size of the, the double crescent cormorant. But just to get you guys in the mindset of sometimes the birds are a million years out on, I say a million years, but literally a million years out into, out into Thompson Lake. So, I mean, I say million years. I'm just, I'm just making, making evident that sometimes birds are so far out there that uh, sometimes they're just not easily, easily identified. But luckily... This was, but this was very far out there. But just keep in mind, sometimes the birds can be very far out at Thompson Lake. So now over to the Globe units. So this is the South Globe unit. So this is the parking lot at, at the South Globe. It goes up and down with the river. I have not been to it this year, uh, this spring, so I don't know what the water level is like right now. Um, but at least in the fall, it can be very good for shorebirds. Um, this is, there's a berm. This is, again, this is the parking lot here. This is off of Dixon Mounds Road. So this is this road comes off the Highway 78 and goes all the way up to Dixon Mountains. So the main parking lot's here. And there's a main berm. When, when it's low enough, there's a main berm that shoots out in the middle of the, 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 the impoundment. Uh, and it can be very good. You see all the mud here. And it can be full of shorebirds in July and August, September. And also full of like pelicans and egrets and those species as well. One year, this very rare little stent, this is... That I ended up getting, even though I went three times to see it, I ended up with bad pictures every time. Uh, one of my friends, Keith, found this bird. Uh, it's the uh, first on my record. The only on my record came from this site here. So you never know what you'll find sorting through all the shorebirds. But sometimes you, you don't have to get grainy pictures of shorebirds like this one. Sometimes species like this western sandpiper can be up close and personal and you can get good looks at birds of this site as well. There's usually hundreds of shorebirds if the conditions are right here. Uh, one year I found this model duck here, so you never know. You might see some interesting species there. And then also on the opposite side of Dixon, Dixon Mounds Road is the North Globe unit. So this is all, basically it goes up and down with the river as well. Sometimes you get scenes like this where you have hundreds of shorebirds at the site, so there's a lot of birds always to pick through here. I think this was a July, uh, sorry, a June picture, so most of these were semi-sands and white rump sandpipers. And you can see like a white rump on this one right here and a white rump on that one there and that one there. <laughs> um, uh, but sometimes it can be full of shorebirds, so on either side. But this is the north side, just on the opposite side of what this is. So this is the south, uh, south, I said south quad. I'm not on campus anymore. This is the south, this is the south globe. And just on the other side of this parking area, and the other side of this levee is this. So that's the north globe. And this is right next to the highway. I was just talking about that. So I'll just go back real quick to that map. Hopefully it doesn't freeze on me. So yeah, I was talking about the south pullovers, which are here. The north and south globes are here. It's on the way to the Dixon Mountain Museum, and then you can go back and then go to the observation tower. It's usually the track that I do here. Or you can go on the north side of North Globe. There's me when I was at very young. Uh, you can see I changed a lot. But I was very young at uh, just right next to the South Globe. is another site right next to the South Globe. Um, that was a very old picture. But this is the, the – the, I was just figured I would include this if people were in, interested in doing a day trip to this area. This is the, the picnic area at Dixon Mounds. 
Um, so there's multiple picnic tables. You can have a nice picnic lunch there to take a break throughout the day. Um, very highly recommend. There's usually like yellow footed warpers singing and other other species, usually like scarlet tanagers and stuff that are singing as well. So you have a nice picnic lunch and hear a bunch of cool birds. And there's also a small road that goes from Dixon Mountains back to the highway. It's called Prairie Road. There's usually prairie warblers. And um, in the late summer, there's usually a lot of these sedrons that are singing there. And also Henslow sparrows can be seen there. And yellow rusted chats and willow flycatchers is kind of the mix between prairies and shrubland habitats. So an interesting road to do. And then the observation overlook, which is kind of on the north side of Thompson Lake. This is looking from the overlook whenever Thompson Lake was high one year. This is boardwalk most years. And I'm assuming this year, this is all cattails actually. But so most times when this lake is lower, like it probably is right now, uh, usually common gallinules can be seen from the boardwalk there. I've seen my face ibis there multiple times, but usually least veterans, common gallinules and Virginia rails can be seen all from that area. Uh, one year, my friend uh, Kevin Richmond, I was actually uh, mowing my grandma's, yawn, uh, grandma's lawn about probably eight or nine years ago, called me with this tricolored heron that he had found there. So multiple people got to see this. This is in the same area as that. So sometimes some rare species can be found just in that little area right next to the boardwalk. So this is based, I think this might have been taken from the boardwalk actually. Sometimes, like I said, ibis is like to show up at this spot as well. This is actually just north of the observation tower. This is actually a glossy ibis. But sometimes both ibis species can be found there. Sometimes shorebirds can actually be found. There's a lot of different species that can be found from the observation tower. You got the lake, you can find the gulls and terns. Sometimes you find some loons. There's some mudflats right in front of the observation tower. You can find shorebirds. Like this is a, a molting sanderling that I had a few years ago. And also this pair of semi palmated sandpipers that were fighting. I figured it was a cool pic picture to put on. This is taken from just below the observation tower. There's also marsh species. Uh, but there's also, I've had snow buntings along the rocks right at the observation tower too. This was a snow bunting and scratching his head. Usually they migrate, well, they show up in the winter wherever it snows, but there's also some that sometimes migrate as early as November. So sometimes they can be seen feeding probably on seeds and insects on the rocks right in front of the observation tower as early as November. But also plenty of sparrows can be found around here as well. This was also taken just north of the observation tower. This is a Lacan sparrow from a few years ago. Um, there's always a crap ton of sparrows all around this area. So a very diverse uh, mix of birds from the observation tower area just itself. So I have a couple spots left over. So I have the um, area south of Havana. This is going to be very quick. This is primarily for those shrubland and grassland species I mentioned from Aridosha. Point again. Um, but the only reliable, the uh, one of the only other reliable spots for Western Kingbird in the state is right here uh, where number three is. It's a substation just south of Havana. Um, I'll have a couple pictures of it in a minute. They probably should be back this year. I have not heard about that yet. But basically, this 1500 road and it goes east and west here. You have grasshopper sparrows that, that are usually here, bobolinks whenever they're migrating, mockingbirds are usually are all along the stretch, bob whites are all along the stretch. But then Sand Lake, whenever the Maha this is actually revolving around the Mahama Aquifer. So whenever the aquifer comes up, this whole area will become flooded. And we've even had e uh, eared grebe nests here. But there's also usually soras and Virginia rails and least bittern and those species that are usually found here. Yes, although it hasn't really been good in the last few years, really. It was maybe two or three years ago for one year. But yes, yeah, I remember seeing the Wimberl there. I've seen white-faced ibis there. Um, it used to be really good when I was growing up. So we had uh, eared, gre uh, eared grebe nesting there. I think it was maybe 2010 or 2011, something like that. And then if you go further out, um, it's a very, probably the best spot in the States to see um, lark sparrows. There's a lot of lark sparrows in this area west, uh, or sorry, east of Highway 97. There's usually a lot of red-headed woodpeckers around here. That was taken just west of the Western Kingbird area. A lot of Eurasian tree sparrows that nest around here, especially at the Western Kingbird location. And here's a, an adult uh, trying to feed a young Western Kingbird with a dragonfly, it appears. Like I said, there's a lot of lark sparrows. This is taken just west of, or sorry, just east of Sand Lake. It's a beautiful sparrow. This is probably the best spot in the entire state to see it. And then, like I said, there's usually a lot of grasshopper sparrows there as well. So definitely a cool area to bird. For some reason, I cannot get a map layout that had the lake here, but I cut off the lake any map layout I had. But anyways, this is Chautauqua. Who, who's all been to Chautauqua in this room? Probably almost everyone, I would assume. So it's a, I'm not going to go in depth with each spot. I almost always start start at the Eagle Bluff parking lot at the Cross Dyke. 
to see what the water levels are at Chautauquan to see where the birds are. I can easily start at the headquarters or go to the Goofy Ridge, but birds shift around all the time, but also the lake levels shift all the time. So I like to start in the middle to see what the lake's like uh, and to also see where the birds are to basically navigate where I want to go. So basically at the headquarters, you can park at the headquarters parking lot and walk. There's some observation towers here. I usually go to the middle one, um, but you can also walk all the way down about a mile down to where it opens up and you can view the south and the south pool if you walk about a mile south on the gravel road that goes straight past the headquarters. So that's the south pool. You can walk and the uh, walk along the main cross strike at the main at the Eagle Bluff parking lot. You can see a lot of birds along here. And there's a couple access areas on the north side. There's the Goofy Ridge parking area, which you can walk out. The main Goofy Ridge flats are here, but there's also another set of flats out here. And we've got the Round Tree Trail and the, and the beer can spot, which is named for beer cans that used to be put on a fence post. I didn't see them there last fall for some reason. But all these, there's multiple areas to view the North Pool. But like I said, multiple people have been there before. So this is the view from the Eagle Bluff parking lot. Always a crap ton of birds here. This is the main cross like here. Sometimes some weird things can be found here, not even shorebird related. And one year I had a near top cormorant. There's usually a lot of dick sizzles around the cross dike. This was taken from the cross dike. This is the North Pool. You can see what the view looks like sometimes. It's all full of shorebirds. You can see a bunch of avocets, a lot of stilts, but as always, the birds are always so far out. Sometimes you find some good birds um, very far out. So this is about two miles out in the pool. So the long tail Jaeger, you can see the little dot there. I know Pete and Jen got the bird, um, but this is whenever I found it. So sometimes birds might be very far out here. So this was at max zoom on the scope and max zoom on the phone. So sometimes you never know what you'll see. And there's a better picture whenever it flew over the cross type. So even though it's kind of grainy, but whatever. <laughs> um, but sometimes you might see scenes like this there where it's just a scene full of shorebirds. And there's thousands, if not tens of thousands of shorebirds, not in the picture, but at the spot on this day. And I saw this from the cross site. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get down there. Well, I fell in the mud, you know, getting out there. So I ended up being completely covered in mud. So sometimes with birding, you have to deal with some consequences of being a little too risky and a little too determined for what you want to see. So you never know. So anyway, so sometimes we get some other weird birds to show up here. One year I had these three ear, uh, ear greaves from the Eagle Bluff parking lot. Last of May, I was scouting for a big day that we were doing and we had uh, just another idea of how far birds can be out here. Sometimes this is a female black scoter that I found in May last year. But just to keep in the mindset that sometimes birds can be very far at the site. So, um, again, birds can be very far at the site. <laughs> um, just another idea that birds can be very far. These are a bunch of goals, turns. There's a ruddy turnstone here, which you can hardly see. And um, some black neck stilts, which, again, you can hardly see over here. Um, but just to keep in the mindset, you can see the one black turn. Hey, I just noticed that. You can see the one black turn sitting there. I specifically remember that sitting there. Uh, but, again, birds can be very far out here. Here's one of the views from the observation platforms at the headquarters. Um, this is the first observation tower they come to. This is the second one. So you can see a beautiful view whenever the lake's lowering. This is actually from the, the observation tower at the headquarters. I've been lucky enough to climb it a couple times to check the antennas for the university. Um, so this is just a beautiful view of the South Pool at Chautauqua. And just another classic scene of all the shorebirds you can see at Chautauqua. Again, uh, uh, just mentioning how far birds can be sometimes. This is a red flower oak from a few years ago that I, that I found. But again, just furthermore mentioning how far birds can be there sometimes. This is the view from the north side of the Groofy Ridge Dyke. Um, you can see all the mud flat there. There's usually a lot of shorebirds there as well. So this is on the north side of the North Pool. Um, and even the spring at the lake's lower, like this year until the recent rains, I know they've been getting shorebirds at Chautauqua, so it probably did look like something like this. So this was... I think maybe from two springs. This is actually, no, this is from last spring. So last spring, there you can see the Wilson's Fowler up some breeding plumage here, some yellow legs and black neck stilts. Sometimes even in spring, it can be good. And sometimes some really good birds can be seen at this end too. This is a male ruff, which is a Eurasian shorebird. You can see the white head and some black on the stomach. This was a molting bird that was found one July. But there's always good birds to be found here. So, And lastly, Sandridge State Forest. Who's been to Sandridge? Another site right next to the... Yes, exactly. So most people have been here. I won't go too quick. I won't go too long here as well. I know I'm running a little later already. So as I mean, as most of you guys know, it's an evergreen forest. I mean, you can see the multiple evergreens here, but it's also really cool for fall colors as well. 
Um, but I usually start either, this is the crossbow spot on the east side. Uh, I usually do this route and any road I do, I usually just drive with the windows down and just stop where I hear a bird flock or see a bird flock. I don't have any particular spots besides the red crossbow stop that I stop at. I always just drive around since it's such an expansive forest, birds move around all the time. So each spot might be good one day, but might be terrible the next day. So I always just drive around with the windows down until I hear a seabird. It's just how I wrote it. So um, anyways, in the fall and winter, I usually start on this road. But in the spring, I usually do Bishop Road, which you can take Manitou Road to Bishop Road and take this road up. This is basically the, technically the south entrance, but another entrance that goes off here. But I usually like doing this in the spring. I've had Connecticut warblers and morning warblers singing along here, but there's also prairie warbler and blueing warbler that nest along this road and a few other species. So it's kind of an interesting way to start the way here. The main headquarters are in the center here, and there's always pine warbler, red breast nut hatch, and the pine campground right next to the headquarters. Instead of keep going, instead of going straight on this road, I always venture off into Pine Valley Drive, which has all the pump houses for the fish hatchery. So this can be very birdy sometimes. So instead of going straight here, I usually this is the north side of Sand Ridge. Um, I always go on this road instead. So if you guys do that, I highly recommend going on that stop as well. And then finally, the Jake Wolf Fish Hatchery. So that's my last uh, little pictures here. Some red crossbills from the red crossbill spot. Red breast nut hatches are always thick through Sand Ridge since it's one of the only evergreen forests in the, in the state. Uh, American woodcocks are everywhere here. This was taken one night. We're, I think we we're even looking for early whippoorwills or something. I can't remember. But anyways, I had this um, American woodcock. They're thick through there on certain times of the year. And sometimes this is super grainy. I know. But sometimes the, the fish hatchery I was just talking about, sometimes some good birds can be found here. So when your little gull was found here, so this is a very distant picture of a juvenile little gull that was there that year. So anyways, I know that was ended up being a lot longer than I expected. There's a lot of places to, get, to go through, but this is actually from yesterday. I, I had the opportunity.